This is the Fifth Estate winning headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you may have missed this morning. But we also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 11th of March, 2021, and I am 2J. I am Tuam. And I am Miss King. Again, in case you missed today's headlines, here they are. Daily Nation, Raila is out of danger, says doctor. The Standard, what ails Raila and the star, visitors blocked as doctors probe Raila's sickness. Yes. Do get well, Baba Man. Mm -hmm. And it appears that all the newspapers are very interested in your health. Yes. Absolutely. But Tuam, what do you think about all of this? Now, I will not mention the... Uh, the Rela is in hospital. But I will today, I will say this, that today William Ruto made a mockery of the executive. He serves him. Mm. He said that the police are independent and have no business taking orders from any quarters. Well, we are not sure if Ruto has read Max Weber, but we will teach him something new today. <laughs> something better than plant science. Oh gosh. <laughs> Weber teaches us that the state is that, is that human community that successfully claims the monopoly of legitimate, uh, legitimate use of violence within a given territory. Mm. The police and military are its main instruments. <laughs> the question we want to ask uh, is this. Doesn't William Ruto know this? Apparently not. Of course he does. <laughs> there is no police officer protecting William Ruto that would take an order from Ruto and disobey it. Mm. After all, he is deputy president. Yeah. We think Ruto just wanted to irritate <coughs> his boss. And if this is true, then we have a story dedicated to his boss. In our view, Uhuru Kenyatta should emulate former Ghanaian president Jerry Rawlings. Uh, who was permanently irritated all the time. One day his vice president started talking nyoko nyoko during a cabinet meeting. Irritated by this, Rawlings stood up and picked him up thoroughly. Mm. Then the vice president drove to the police station and reported the president. The officer who recorded the statement was promoted that afternoon, <laughs> acting swiftly. Guess why? Because he did nothing. Mm. What's our point here? Who should cane Ruto just for fun? <laughs> then Ruto must be made to go and report the caning to Matiangi. Mm. Matiangi should write a statement, then sit on it. Then Matiangi should be promoted to vice president. Oh my gosh. Ama oh namnagani, my friends. Oh my goodness. goodness. Wow. Wait, so just to go back uh, to him, the context here <laughs> was um, yes. Ruto reporting back Pre or precisely making a statement back to Matiangi. In fact, I should have said the context much earlier. What happened yesterday is Matiangi was giving a lecture to the cops and, the, and the, to the, the judiciary. And he said that there's no reason, absolutely no reason, a suspect should be given bond seven, uh, seven times. Mm. Right? There must be a threshold to ensure <laughs> that this fellow is put in remand for some time before he, a hearing is done. But then today, William Ruto, somewhere in a cool uh, thing at a funeral, he's, he responded to Matiangi and he said that there's nobody, there's no one who has any powers to correct, uh, I mean, to order the, the, the police and to order the judiciary. And that is why I read Max Weber for him. Rubbish. So you're saying now that Uhuru should cane him for yes. fun? Yes, for and fun. And that Ruto should go report that to, to Matiangi? To, to Matiangi. And Matiangi, and then should, Matiangi do nothing about it. should do nothing about it. And get it. promoted. And get promoted to, to, to you deputy have president. Notice. <laughs> So I'm going to switch gears. I think we decided today that we would put the headlines on pause and discuss other more important matters, even though Baba Man Alive and Healthy is very critical. Fantastic. Exactly. But we have said in the past that constitutions are made in times of crisis. Yes. And in the absence of a crisis, they precipitate a crisis. Yes. In our view, country is anxious. And my question is, has the crisis arrived or is it simply knocking at our door? Yes. Already, we are dealing with a rogue judiciary right. that served us a nullified election and notice to dissolve parliament. Yes. They lay these crisis, crises at our feet yes. with no solution and no sympathy. Right. Following this, we are approaching a succession election. Mm. The likes that we last witnessed in 1977. Mm. And this is topped by the fact that elections make our country unproductive. Mm. Two years before an election and two years after. Yes. Uhuru Kenyatta told us that he wants to change the politics of stupid in this country by amending the constitution. Yes. And he has told us that BBI will do that. Correct. What quacks, like Linda Katiba, don't tell you, mm. is that they do not know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So today I want to explain the nature of constitutions 
and why Kenyans need not fear changing them. Yes. So constitutions change when they fail to keep the country moving towards, sorry, keep the country moving forward, yes. and when they do not make way for political inclusion. Correct. So here, amendments and replacements are the main way to change constitutions yes. in times of need. Yes. And given the disruptive nature of a replacement, yeah. it really makes sense that they should only happen during exceptional events. Yes. I think when we changed our constitution, that was considered an exceptional event. Correct. Now, constitution making in established democracies really confirms this. Yeah. The US constitution dates back to 1789, yes. with only 27 amendments made. Yeah. Norway, Belgium and Denmark yes. have the exact same constitutions they enacted in the 19th century. Yes. That's over 200 years ago. Correct. And in Western European countries, they have adopted 3.2 constitutions in a 200 year span. Whoa. And in these constitutions, they had a lifespan of over 76.6 years. Whoa. Now this is compared to Latin America, where there has been an average of 10.6 constitutions per country during that similar period. Whoa. However, this soon reduced to an average of 5.3 constitutions in recent decades. Yeah. So the question is, what changed? Correct. As the strength of Latin America's new democracies increased, yes. the rate of constitutional replacement decreased. Correct. Stability meant that fewer changes needed to happen. Now we turn to Kenya. First of all, mm -hmm. the BBI bill is proposing a constitutional amendment, yeah. not a replacement. Correct. And as a country, we believe that we are currently satisfied with our existing constitution. Yes. But there are things about our constitution that don't work. Yes. An overly strong judiciary, post-election violence, succession politics, and economic hardship every five years. So the question is this, do we want stability? Or do we want to remain comfortable with constant and persistent crises? I will leave that question to the public. Fantastic. I couldn't have put it better. I'm telling you, that is the argument for BBI if you mm -hmm. ever had one. And yes. if you've not had one, I suggest you share it. How about you should start it? <laughs> Well, as I said before, this week there is no politics. And we say there is no politics because all the papers today are talking about Raila and his illness. Mm -hmm. And we are pleased to hear that Baba Man was not sick, but he was tired. Yes. Yes. And we wish you a restful and quick recuperation. Yes. But if Baba Man is tired, and he's tired because he has worked hard on the BBI campaign, yes. we must remind Parliament that they should not sleep. Mm. Yes. In the famous words of the late Otieno Kajuang, Bado Mapambano, uh -huh. Parliament has a task before them in passing BBI and even as they dilly dally on the job they would do well to remember that they Parliament have the fabled sword of Damocles hanging over Ooh. their heads yes and the sword of Damocles dates back to an ancient parable popularized by the Roman philosopher Cicero right in that fable yeah. Dionysius the second a yes. very tyrannical king was yes. dissatisfied yes. when a court Flatterer named Damocles showered the king with compliments and remarked how blissful his life must be. Mm -hmm. So the king was determined to give Damocles a taste of his kingly life. Yes. So he sat Damocles on a golden couch and ordered a host of servants to wait on him with food and drink. Yes. Damocles couldn't believe his good fortune, mm -hmm. but just as he was starting to enjoy the life of a king, he noticed that the king had also hung a razor sharp sword from the ceiling. Yeah. The sword was positioned over Damocles Damocles' head suspended by a single strand of horsehair. Yeah. From then on, Damocles' fear for his life made it impossible for him to enjoy the food mm. and the servants. Yes. So when I say that Parliament has a sword of Damocles hanging over its head, yeah. I mean that Parliament is in a situation where there is a threat looming yes. over mm. it. Yeah. And this threat is imminent. Yes. It could befall Parliament at any time. Yes. The threat is the dissolution of Parliament <laughs> by the President. Yes. Now, Maraga gave the President a blank check as he exited office as Chief Justice. And the check read, dissolve Parliament for failing to pass legislation and the two-thirds gender rule. Mm -hmm. The time for the dissolution is not expressly stated in law and the President can cash on his check at any time. Oh boy. So if I were Parliament, I would stop enjoying the free period because Baba Man is resting, <laughs> and I would work on BBI immediately. The sword could fall at any 
time. Oh, do, do, wow. do, do you think, uh, Ruto or Karen, do you think they know what the sword of Damocles is? If it hit them, do you think it, they would know what it is? No, so this is what I was explaining. Mm -hmm. they are, if they know what's good for them, they should listen exactly. to me and learn. Instead of sitting pretty. Instead of sitting pretty, do some work. Exactly. We have a three-part criteria that we used to judge the headlines for you. We ask ourselves three questions. Is it topical or speculative, repetitive or groundbreaking and thoughtful, or just plain lazy? Now, all three deal with the illness of Ryla mm. and while that is a good thing that he's getting better, I would say that we toss them for not giving Both, us yeah. substance. And none of them are very respectful to the strong man that he is. Toss them off. Absolutely. I toss them, especially the one asking about his visitors. <laughs> Um, today we will not go into the cartoons, but feel free to look into them. There's some <laughs> interesting things there. I love there. it. I love it. And now on to our final thought. But before we get there, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now our final thought. Today we will do two books. The first one, The Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca, Rebecca Sklot. And the second one, Hidden Figures, The Untold Story of the African-American Women Who Helped Win the Space Race by Margot D. Chatelier. Wow, all right. Two books to him. Wow. Let's go. Uh, so this week is inspired by International Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of looking at two books is to tell the stories of women who contributed to STEM in such a massive way. Mm -hmm. STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. So these black women who contributed in such a massive way, and their stories were just never told. And these books really bring to the fore the contributions that they did make. Mm -hmm. So the, we'll start... Uh, firstly, with The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. And this is a story of science, mm. family, and a black woman who changed the world. Mm. So in 1951, mm. an African-American woman named Henrietta Lacks discovered what she called a knot on yes. her cervix right. that turned out to be a particularly dangerous form of cervical cancer. Yeah. So she goes to John Hopkins um, Hospital, mm. which was one of the best in the country at that time, mm. but it subscribed to deeply racist practices when it came to treating African Americans. Right. So as Lax was receiving treatment, another doctor by the name of George Gay mm. asked for samples of tissue from Henrietta Lax mm. without her consent. At the time, no human cells had ever survived long enough in a laboratory, yeah. but Henrietta's cancer cells not only survived, but they could grow indefinitely. Mm. So as her cancer cells began growing at an extraordinary rate and flourish, mm. Henrietta continued to decline. Mm. She underwent treatment for her cancer, but she succumbed to the disease, mm. leaving behind her five children and her husband. All the while, the Lacks family had no idea that doctors had taken some cells from her body or that some of them were still alive. Mm. So this story actually is about the author, Rebecca, Rebecca Sklut, yes. trying to trace the story of this woman who contributed so massively to science. Yeah. So when writing the book, the author reaches out to Henrietta's family, but they were very reluctant to talk to her. Mm. Uh, Rebecca attempted to contact the Laxes, mm. but they had experienced other white journalists who had exploited them. Mm. She learned that they had a general mistrust in medicine because of the medical community's past exploitation of black Americans. One example in the book is given of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments in the 1930s, where scientists allowed uneducated poor black men to suffer from syphilis and go untreated so that they could study the disease. Horrible. But the immortality of Henrietta and her cells saw shipments of this, the Hella cells, they were called, to researchers in Texas, India, New York, Amsterdam, and many places in between. Yeah. Those researchers gave them to more researchers mm. who gave them to more still. Mm. Her cells even rode into the mountains, you know, I think they say on the back of a donkey in Chile. Mm. Her cells aided in the creation of the polio vaccine mm. and the first ever operation to mass produce human cells. But Henrietta and her family were largely forgotten from this story. Mm. After her death, her family struggled to make ends meet. But her cells were commercialized and have generated millions of dollars in profit for the medical researchers who patented her tissue. Nonetheless, this story really exposed the story of the woman behind the cells and brought her to life. I really, really enjoyed reading this book. It's a great book. Yeah, it's it really is a great book. And for me, it makes me feel really sad because as you talked about, they were having an ongoing experiment at um, Johns Hopkins mm. where they were trying to look for cells, human cells that could self-regenerate. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually the whole purpose that they were looking for. Yeah. And um, th there was a practice at the hospital that whenever anyone was admitted into the hospital, they would take your cells. Mm. Now, if you were white, they'd first ask for your consent mm -hmm. before yeah. they take your cells. But because Henrietta was black and ironically, she had given birth, I think, 
like three weeks before yeah. mm. and note that she had been in there same hospital but yeah. they hadn't realized that she had an aggressive cancer in her uterus I mm. could not understand I know, this. Yeah, it's irony. mind-boggling some of the details. Completely yeah. mind-boggling. But then also on the other hand, how these white people are also very um, conscientious. They still marked the cent- the cells hell just to that's how we know they came from Henrietta. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, reading this, I, I couldn't help but think that we black people are all the same everywhere. The more backward we are, the more we tend to blame the devil or supernatural stuff, even on diseases. Where are you going with this? Yes. Like many black southerners born during the 20th, 20th century, Henrietta's family was and remained highly superstitious. Many of them had supernatural explanations for the virulence of Henrietta's cancer. Her sister believed it was a punishment from God to Henrietta specifically because she did not care for her ailing father. Wow. Henrietta's son, however, believed all diseases could be traced back to Adam and Eve's original sin of eating the forbidden apple. <laughs> Only Kuti, Henrietta's first cousin, believed a supernatural force was the source of Henrietta's illness. He thought that that disease-causing spirits were to blame for her condition. Second question I asked myself when reading this book is why would black people feel comfortable going to hospitals if they knew they'd receive lesser care for life-threatening illnesses? Mm. Black patients received fewer pain medications and were often rejected from hospitals because of their inability to pay. Hospitals such as uh, John Hopkins, uh, 2J, you said, whose founding purpose was to help those who otherwise couldn't get medical care, were rare. Mm -hmm. If and when black patients did receive medical care, it was at significantly later stages in their illnesses than white patients. So then I ask, why go to white hospitals if you knew you'd come off worse than you entered. But what I found sickening was the fact that public ward patients owed doctors their bodies for research if Mm. they could not pay. This was a transactional model of medicine that valued life as long as it was profitable. Wealthy patients who could afford to pay received medical care without strings attached. This sneaky culture of this arrangement meant that patients could not make informed decisions about whether they were willing to participate in research uh, in exchange for free medical care. What a damn world. And you know what's even worse about that? You're talking about a story from the 1950s. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's still happening today, today. in the 2020s. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, as you said to him, what a world. What a world. But I also feel like there is a, a correlation between the, and as you said correctly, Africans are the same wherever they are. Yeah. And even here in Africa, the poorer you are, the harder it is for you to access medical care. And I think that yeah. a reason why they went later was not because they, they were trying not to subject themselves to the white hospitals, but because you went when it was absolutely necessary. necessary. When your disease or illness was so severe that you mm. could yeah, not mm. manage it at home and you had to submit yourself to the hospital, which is yeah. what happened with yeah. Henrietta. Yeah. She landed at the hospital with a huge tumor. Yeah. Yeah. And by the time they were opening it up, they were in shock as to how large it had, it had grown. Advanced. So and what is our is second it? book? Our second book is okay. Hidden Figures, and I think that almost everyone has read the book. And if they haven't read the book, they've watched the movie, yeah. and which is as good as the book. And it talks about three women who worked with the beginnings of NASA, mm. the National Aeronautic um, Authority, I think, as we, I think it was called, yeah. Yeah. and uh, that later became NASA as we know it. Yeah. And we talk about their story and how they contributed to science and how they were called computers. There was a wing called the West Wing, mm. and that was where they were housed, and how three women in particular, one a matriarchal figure that um, Mrs. Vaughn who put them together, who coordinated the girls and made sure that they would um, educate themselves even as they transitioned into the computer world and mm-hmm. the physical computers were changed into actual computers but yet they were able to continue with making money in a world that was segregated. Mm-hmm. They had a bad life as was depicted in the movie. They had no bathrooms, mm-hmm. they had no acceptance of their role and they had no validation of their authority. Mm-hmm. Many of these women started out, as, started out as math teachers. That was the thing I was interested to learn. Right. And as um, the war came in and men went out to fight there was a lacuna, a gap. Mm. There was human resource that was needed and it was lacking. Yeah. So these 
math teachers then applied to NASA and got jobs calculating trajectories. And as the movie rightly predicts, Catherine, um, ca she actually calculated the yeah. trajectory for the first orbit around the moon and even Whoa. for Apollo 11, mm. even when the computers were calculating, she did that. Mm. Mm. But for me, the more important thing, as we looked at Henrietta Lacks and saw her humanity, was the humanity of this woman. Yeah. I couldn't help but think that um, these black women mm. were also human beings. Mm. They were able to um, rise above their situation. They were mothers yeah. first, they were women mm. who were taking care of their children, they were wives, mm. and yet they were awesome in their fields. Mm. And that spoke to me as a young woman, a mother, and a wife. And yeah. I realized that it doesn't have to, I don't have to do anything special yeah. to be able to make it in the world. Mm. And I can still be a mom and exceptional and do it all. I could have my cake and eat it. <laughs> oh yeah, yes. That was my takeaway from uh, yeah. it. I, I believe you when you say that. <laughs> you believe me when I say that. I like it. Today we had no winning headline and no winning cartoon. Please don't forget to find us on your TV screens. We're on Pan Free to Air, Go TV and Star Times. And on the importance of women and on women's who've been, women who've been heated in the fine print of science, I have an excerpt from a poem by Maya Angelou called Still I Rise. Mm. And it says, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. Mm. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Mm -hmm. Out of the huts of history's shame I rise, up from a past that's rooted in pain I rise. I am a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Amen. And that's what these four women yeah. have done. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Do have a great evening. God bless you.